Hey, we're not a freak. <laughs> hey guys, how you doing? It is me, Dr. Shingema Viman. I'm back with another episode in our uh, Pan-African lecture series, and in particular, this uh, Intro to African History series. Um, last week, we spoke about the Africa and the First World War, right? We spoke about um, how African territories, particularly those that were uh, that had been colonized by the Germans, uh, Cameroon, Togo, Tanganyika, Namibia. Um, uh, we spoke about those. We spoke about the hundreds and thousands of Africans who fought in the trenches at home, uh, at, 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 in the trenches in Europe and at home on the continent. We spoke about um, the amount of livestock and resources such as cotton that were used. Uh, to, to, to furnish the, the First World War. Um, we also saw how the end of the war had critical results for the continent, including the shift of power in the German colonies, rapid urbanization, uh, the waning of the European invincible myth. Uh, we spoke about how uh, Woodrow Wilson's 14 points had focused on, on self-determination, which even though it was not intended, for Africans, the African intellectuals and nationalists began to run with as a rallying cry uh, for, for increased nationalism. We also saw the creation of the League of Nations uh, of which Ethiopia became a member. So Africa was in a way represented on there even though minimally so as we shall see as we go on. So today we're talking about Africa and the Second World War. And uh, without further ado, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. If you're enjoying these videos, Leave a comment, like, subscribe, share it with somebody else who may be interested in learning African history. Like I said, this is part of the Intro to African History series. We will be starting, you know, very soon we'll be having other lectures about very specified and very specialized topics. So, again, without further ado, let's get into our material for this week. And just like that, we are cooking with gas. I will see you guys at the end of the presentation. So a, a good starting point for, for the Second World War and Africa. Now, just as a quick refresher, uh, there were two main combating sides, right? On one side was Germany in the Second World War, Germany, Italy, and Japan, right? Uh, the, the Axis powers, if you will. Then on the other side was, uh, was uh, Great Britain, uh, the Soviets, as well as the US later on, uh, sort of the Grand Alliance, but that's the side that also France fell on. So those are the two sort of larger, you know, those are the alliance powers versus the Axis powers. Those are the larger groups, uh, along uh, larger lines along which the war was organized. So and Italy, we already, you know, the stuff that, uh, the, how Germany got to be in that position is well documented, right, with Hitler and the likes. But what is less told is I Italy's involvement in the war. And I think a large part of that story really is their involvement in Africa. So let's talk a little bit about that. With Italian unification only achieved in 1870, Italy was a relatively much younger and weaker nation than its neighbors and fellow Berlin Conference signatories. Thus, by the end of the 19th century, they occupied very little territory in the coastal areas of Somalia and Eritrea. Now compare that with, say, England, I mean, with Great Britain that had large parts of Southern Africa, as well as Nigeria and, 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 um, and Ghana and Sierra Leone, or France that basically had the rest of West Africa and significant parts of North Africa in their control. In 1896, Italy tried to get in on the scramble uh, of Africa action by attacking Ethiopia, one of the remaining independent states on the continent. The East African Christian country, however, was undergoing its own resurgence under King Menelik II, who, after taking power in 1889 and consolidated within the empires, such groups as the non-Christian Oromos, the Sidama, and some of the Somali population that lived in Ethiopia. Melanic's forces, which numbered more than 100,000, 
were well armed with modern weaponry as well. However, Menelik himself, shrewd uh, tactician he was, downplayed the military strength by leaking falsehoods, uh, leaking false reports indicating a much smaller number of troops under his command and spreading rumors that there, were, there was widespread discord among his forces. Food, <laughs> the Italians gave uh, the order to advance to Adwa. And that is what is depicted in this image here. That's the battle. That's one of the famous depictions of the battle. Um, so Italy advances with 14,500 men against an Ethiopian army of more than 100,000, right? The Italian columns, in addition to having to deal with a lack of adequate supplies, were disorganized and unable to successfully navigate the terrain. So they were routed on March 1st, and then they retreated again through the difficult terrain. The number of those in the Italian army that were killed were estimated to have been around 6,000, uh, you know, slightly more than, more or less half the Italian troops. Um, and the large part of the remainders were African troops that were hired by Europeans, who are often nicknamed the Ascari. Additionally, between 3,000 and 4,000 of those fighting under Italian command were taken prisoner by the Ethiopians. So around 70% of Italy's soldiers were killed or captured, right? Now, more than 5,000 Ethiopians and, and even more were, uh, were, were killed or captured. But just when you look at the proportion of it, right, these guys had marched with like 15,000 people. And for them to have like 10,000 of them killed or captured, that's the Italians, was more drastic than the 6,000 or so that, that the, that uh, out of a hundred thousand that the Ethiopians suffered. So that was that battle of Adwa, very important moment that, that, that describes how Ethiopia stayed uncolonized when the rest of the continent did. Italy did get in on some action though. By 1911, they had regrouped and defeated the Turks to claim control of Libya in 1911. But even then, they were still faced by stiff resistance from the Sanusia Brotherhood, which is a Sufi Brotherhood um, that would not let up and not grant them full control of the territory. And they held on for 20 more years until 1931. That's when, they, when the Sanusia re, uh, resistance finally broke down and Italy finally took control of Libya. Now, because of the embarrassment of the Battle of Adwa back in 1896. And because of the aspirations shared between, uh, between uh, Mussolini and Hitler and, 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 and uh, the Axis powers, if you will, Italy had to get back in the, in the colonial game. So in 1935, they tried again at Ethiopia, right? So in 1935, 120,000 Italian troops stormed Ethiopia. And even then, they, f and they, they did so by bombing villages and sp uh, spreading poison gas, raping Ethiopian women by the hundreds, right? Even, and, and they also had the benefit now of far more advanced uh, artillery and, and, and weaponry. But even then they failed to break down Ethiopia until after several months, right? And, and when they did, even when they did, they still were not able to subdue the whole country, which is why we insist that Ethiopia was never colonized because for, for, for a colony to be called so, um, the colonizer has to have control of the resources, government, and uh, law and order to a, to a large degree, right? Which was never the case in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia at the time was one of two uncolonized African territories. The other one, and I put uncolonized in parenthesis because uh, the other one is Liberia. And we've already described in previous videos, the dynamics in Liberia, which are technically not colonized, uh, but still represents a, at a solid Western hand in the establishment thereof. So Ethiopians continue to resist, right? Continue to resist. Oh, by the way, the, if this is the Battle of Adwa, 
this is uh, a depiction of the battle of uh, <clears throat> of uh, the the seizure of of Libya by 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 the Italians. All right. <clears throat> Now, remember we mentioned earlier that Ethiopia was the only African country in the League of Nations, and in it, it was represented by this dapper gentleman here, uh, Ras Tafari, Ras, first name Tafari, um, you know, who later picked up the name uh, Ailey Selassie. And you will know him from, if you are a fan of reggae music or reggae culture, you will know Ailey Selassie from that because he's a, he's a mainstay in in, in reggae music, in which he is revered almost as a as a as a, as a demigod in in that particular community. But in any case, he was the emperor of uh, of Ethiopia at the time, having succeeded uh, Menelik, who led the resistance against uh, against uh, Italians in the in the Battle of Adwa. So as the war broke out, Elis Selassie had fled into exile into Europe, during which he petitioned the League of Nations, right? Challenge the League of Nations that you said the League of Nations has been founded to protect countries and protect our sovereignty, right? Um, what gives, you know, especially regarding smaller countries um, of which Ethiopia at this point was relatively small, at least in, in, in military and, and technological might. Why is he not being protected and this these are his words he warned that international morality was at stake god and history will remember your judgment are the states of the league going to set up the terrible precedent of bowing before force right so that's what he said however now remember this is 1936 and if you uh if you know anything about about Hitler and his rise one of the ways one of the ways in which his path was cleared was through this principle of appeasement by a power such as the British and the and the French and the like who did not realize that his colonial Euro continental uh, colonial aspirations were were um as grand and, and terrible as they were until it was too late, right? In which they, they continued to try to appease because they were all reeling from the First World War. So they they'll give him an, an inch and he takes a mile. And that would continue, right, until it was too late, until the blitzkrieg was in full swing. The same principle was at play here with, uh, with Italy in Ethiopia, right? Because the 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 british and then the french and, and and other such groups were not willing to compromise the quote unquote peace that had been established in the aftermath of the world war of the first world war at the time called the great war you know to to stop a european power like italy getting into into ethiopia so they let it slide right you know this is the principle of of, of uh of overall appeasement so give him an inch, they take a mile. So the Italian forces by 1940 were expanding, right? It wasn't until the Italians wandered into British Somaliland in September 1940 that the British began to push back. And by January 1941, the operation to seize back Ethiopia began. Ailey Selassie returned from, uh, from, from abroad and led an Ethiopian force into battle. The Brits also sent, the British people sent, the British government sent uh, reinforcements from its uh, West African colonies, which were Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, and other countries sent contingents as well. These include the Belgians um, who sent some Congolese soldiers and the French who sent some, some soldiers from West Africa as well. So by, so quickly and rapid was this that by, May 1941, Ailey uh, Selassie was back in power. And I've included here a, a short video that I'll put in the description that describes, uh, uh, that talks a little bit about, about Ailey Selassie. Um, I'll also put another article because 
as I say all the time, this is an intro to African history class, so we're just dealing with more surface level histories. But the legacy of Haile Selassie has been heavily debated, um, with many citing his fleeing into exile during this time as 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 cowardice. Uh, that that's something that have, that some people have argued, and that other folks, including the, I believe his his name is is Taziza, who is the nationalist who is said to have written the speech that. Eli Selassie read at the, at the League of Nations, as well as organized the troops that Selassie would come back and quote unquote lead into battle, um, who's largely been written out of the more uh, colloquial history books, as well as yeah, as well as other things. So I'll put that article in the in the in the in the in the comments below. I mean, in the in the description box below and you can uh, have your way with it and, and sort of develop a more nuanced understanding of this. And hopefully soon I'll have somebody who knows more about this come onto the channel and speak a little more about it. Now, of the Axis powers, it wasn't just, it wasn't just Italy that had a stake in Africa, right? In 1941, Hitler sent the Africa Corps, an expeditionary force uh, German army force to assist Italy in Libya. Remember we said that the, the Italians had, oh, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, maybe I didn't talk about this, but as part of their, of the expansion, the Italians had grown into Libya, into, into British Somaliland, but they'd also gone into Libya, right? They claimed Libya and they started to encroach into Egypt as well. Which is uh, which caused conflict with the British, and the British started to push back. So that's what this is about. So this Africa Corps was sent to Italy. It was sent to to Libya to to assist the the the, the Italians by, by 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 Hitler, and they wanted to and particularly they wanted to seize back control of the Suez Canal, which is over here, right? The, that's where the Suez Canal is over here. This is Egypt. Then going this here, this way we have Libya uh, and such. Um, and this is of strategic importance because it is, the, you know, it, as you can tell, it connects this to the uh, to Asia at large, but particularly to the to the oil fields of the Persian Gulf. So whatever Western European country has has control of 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 this of this axis is critical. So that's what Germany, um, that's what Hitler was, was seeking, and also as part of his colonial expansion. He had vowed that Germany would regain its rightful place in the tropical sun. What does that mean? Well, remember that at the end of the First World War, um, German territories such as uh, Togo, Namibia, Tanganyika had been redistributed and, and become protectorates and colonies of other countries, uh, Tanganyika with the British, uh, Togo with France and so forth. Um, Namibia with, with South Africa. So part of his, so Germany wasn't present on the continent anymore. And so the tropical sun he is describing is largely the African sun and they wanted to, they wanted to reclaim territory within that space as well. However, the Africa Corps, even though they, 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 they did some damage, they were also stifled by uh, Russian resistance that same year in which, um, you know the 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 Russians um, invading Germany or the Russian invasion in in Europe really diverted their attention and they had to focus on that. And um, eventually, Allied forces the Allied forces broke into Egypt in 1942, started pushing back the Africa calls. Um, the Africa calls, um, while Americans and the British descended on on on, Mor on Morocco and Algeria. And the war caused. You know, the war caused much destruction, particularly in North Africa, with thousands of Libyans and Tunisians losing their lives um, in the process. And they finally, the Africa Corps finally surrendered in 1943. West Africa was also very much involved in the struggle, right? And these are some numbers, just roughly some numbers here, because I think what is to be said is the fact that several 
the whole continent was involved in parts, but I think this West African numbers are pretty interesting with um, in the in those two years, the 1943 to 1945, more than 100,000 militants, uh, uh, West African militants were back in France, right? With many of them uh, continuing to fight even when, uh, when, when France had fallen or when France had been captured, you know, so they fought on behalf of, of, of what we call free France as opposed to Vichy France. Some were also fighting on the side of Vichy France because, you know, they were just in the arena now. Um, so, so many Africans were captured by the Nazis as well and many continued to fight for free France. You know, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands here. So that's, that's important as we go into this next, text, next section here. So what is the impact of the Second World War on Africa and Africans? Now, there are so many things we can say, right? So I already spoke about the militants, okay? I already spoke about these, you know, how many Africans were fought in the war. Again, hundreds of thousands here and there. Africa was also an essential source of labor and raw materials in the war, right? At the time, West Africa became the sole ally provider. We've already spoken about how palm oil was a big export from, from West Africa, but they became the only provider to the allied troops of, of palm oil. However, this is not to just be seen as advancement on their part because a lot of this was being driven by, by colonial mandates, right? You know, more hands on colonial mandates which meant that this came at no increased profits to the Africans. You know, they were being, if anything, the Africans were being more stringently siphoned uh, to, to finance the war, right? It also stimulated colonial investment. I think these are things that are, that are important to talk about, that the colonial powers had indeed been investing in their colonies, you know, as much as it benefited them but they really upped their game during the war with investing in things like uh, harbors, uh, ports, airports, these sort of things that were becoming more and more important as they had to get, get goods, uh, raw materials, resources from the continent, as they needed to fly people out, in and out, right? As the battle was being, as battles were actually being fought on the continent, as we have seen in, in Ethiopia, uh, Libya, Egypt, and these places. Um, so, you know, you even see at the time, you know, building up such things as uh, uh, the Freetown and Lag uh, Lagos ports, which are still important in size today. We see the Accra airport, which is uh, one of the bigger ones on the continent. And even the industrialization of South Africa uh, kicks into full gear at the time. And I found this interesting um, pamphlet called Workers at War, and it's, uh, it speaks to which speaks about the African mine worker strike in 1946, this is in South Africa. And just to show that in the, uh, the growth of industry often coincides with the growth of, um, of mobilization and, and unionization and, and the strikes were, were a large part of that. So you start to see them become commonplace as these places uh, develop as well. Then of course we spoke about how, how the continent had, uh, rapidly urbanized in the aftermath of the First World War or the Great War, and that would just continue after the Second World War as more people came as, for the reasons that I've already described with manufacturing and things growing as well as more increased uh, investment, as well as people coming back, these militants coming back from, from, from the wars that they have been involved in and not choosing not to go back to, to their rural life, having been exposed to these different spaces. So that's something else that, that, that also happens. Continuing with the impact of the war on Africa and Africans. So what does this mean for the colonial project? Well, one of the things that the Second World War did was it set off imperial fatigue. What does that mean? Well. Remember the empires, the British Empire, the French Empire, uh, the, the, the Spanish, Portuguese empires were 
empire takes a lot of effort, right? The empire takes a lot of effort to maintain. So as they, the, the First World, World War and the, and the Great Depression, remember that comes soon after that, and, um, and now the Second World War had taken so much from the, remember the, also the colonies in large part, I mean, the empires in large part are who were the main militants in many ways during the war, okay? During, during, the, during, during the, the Second World War. So they, they were, their resources were spent, they were tired. The French for a long time had been on the losing, had been, you know, conquered by, 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 by the Nazi, by Nazi Germany. The British had given so much resources and, and so forth. So coming out of, the, out of the Second World War, the empires were getting tired and starting to concede. And we see this in, in many ways with the immediate independence of, um, of the British Raj of, of, in, I mean, of, of, yeah, of India and, and Pakistan in 1947, and so many other changes that happened immediately after that. And, but in Africa, we see them start to concede little by little, right? Um, liberties and, and sovereignty to different groups, albeit compromised, albeit still in the form of a colony. But they, they, they were, the system wasn't as profitable as it used to be anymore. Um, and that's beginning, beginning in the 1950s, you know, we start to see independence with countries like Libya and Ghana getting their independence then. Another impact was the Atlantic Charter was put out, right? The Atlantic Charter being the 1941 document that was drawn up by Churchill, right, and, and Roosevelt, which had this, these dictates. I'll, I'll read, it had eight main clauses, but here's a few of them, and I will explain to them how these were relevant to Africa. First, the country seek no aggrandizement, territory or other, right, one. Second, there is, they, they desire to see no territorial changes that do not accord with the freely expressed wishes of the people concerned. Third, they respect the rights of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they, li they will live. And they wish to see sovereign rights and sovereign government restored to those who have been forcibly deprived of them. Fourth, they will endeavor with due respect for existing obligations to further the enjoyment by all states, great or small, victor or vanquished of access on equal terms to the trade and to the raw materials of the world which are needed for their economic prosperity. Fifth, they desire to bring about the fullest collaboration between all nations in the economic field with the object of securing for all improved labor standards, economic advancement and social security. So these were some of the things that were decided on. There were eight main ones. I think I read four or five. Now, what they had in mind were the Europeans that had been conquered, that had been conquered by, as part of the, of the, of the Nazi rampaging across the, 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 the European continent. We're talking about Austria, we're talking about Poland, we're talking about uh, Netherlands and all those places right through that had been conquered by, 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 by Germany. That's what they had in mind in large part when they say this. <clears throat> they were not thinking about the colonies of Africa. There was no way the British under Winston Churchill would have said all these things with Africa in mind because that would be self-defeating, right? However, those dictates are the same ones that the, the African intellectuals and nationalists, as they had done with Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, would seize upon and start to develop, start to develop um, a counter narratives like, wait, if this is true for you, how can it not be true for us? How can you talk about countries they, they, that seek no aggrandizement, territory or other, because you're talking about Germany colonizing Czechoslovakia and, and, and Austria and Poland, right, going that way. Why does the same thing not apply to the British or French empire on the continent, right? So these are the things that they start thinking about. How can you talk about people choosing, the, being free to choose their form of government when the, South, when the black South Africans that make up 80, more than 80% of the country 
do not get to, to, to vote, you know, so these are the things. And one of the more famous documents that came out of that is called the African Claims, which was written by the African National Congress in South Africa. And I think this comes out in at their Congress in 1943. And let me see if I can uh, find a little bit of what, uh, what that document says. All right, here goes. In response to the claims. So the Afri this document is called the African Claims in South Africa. And it goes, um, I apologize, okay. So what they would do is they would, and I'll post it in the description as well. What they will do is they will post the statement from the Atlantic Charter, then respond to it. Their, their country signal aggrandizement, territory or otherwise then they would go on to say like, firstly, the status and independence of Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia, and the right to sovereignty must be safeguarded. And any political and economic assistance she may need must be freely negotiated. Secondly, we urge that uh, as a fulfill fulfillment of the war aim of the allied nations, namely to liberate territories and people under foreign documentation, the former Italian colonies in Africa should be granted independence and their security provided for under the future system of the world security. Thirdly, they are the anxieties of Africans with regard to British protectorates in Southern Africa. It is well known that the Un Union of South Africa is what. So in any case, I'll put the, the document for you to read to yourself. But uh, the point here is that the, this nationalist organization in South Africa had seized on to the, to the Atlantic Charter and written a very visceral response pointing out its hypocrisies, right? So that ties into the next point here, which is the rise in African nationalism. Um, and African nationalism rose for several reasons as well. What um, the Euro in European invincibility myth that had started to wane after the First World War continued to wane. You know, the folks had seen the Italians lose in battle, the Germans lose in battle, the French even as part of the larger winning side had been conquered for a while. And, and the Africans had not only seen this, but they had been involved in this. So they had seen that the military and, and socio-technological might of the, of, of, of the Western Europeans was not, was not invincible. And they knew that if, you know, so the idea of fighting against them was was uh was slowly being propagated right um secondly the anti-tyranny hypocrisy which stems to the to the idea, idea of the atlantic charter i was just talking about that how can these folks who go out and and fight to stop the spread of of nazism and and colonialism european colonialism how can they turn around and then continue to, to, to colonize us, you know, to treat us in many ways, really, if you start looking at some of these places in ways that, are, that resemble the colonies, right? That resemble the uh, Hitler's colonies across the continent of Europe. So how does it make it make sense? You know, make it make sense. Um, then finally, uh, and th there's a great, uh, this, you may not be able to read this, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and do so on your behalf, and this is a, a, a snippet from the book African Nationalism by the Reverend Nabaningi Stolle. I think it was published in 1951, one of the more seminal books of the time. Uh, Reverend Nabaningi Stolle, of course, uh, being a Zimbabwean nationalist, who was uh, the founder of, of many, many of the movements. But here goes. During the, war, the, during the war, the British officers appealed to the Africans to join the armed services, so they began extensive propaganda against the Nazis. The British were not the only ones who did this. Practically all the Allied powers did the same thing. The following story typifies well the attitude of the African and other subject peoples. Away with Hitler, down with him, said the British officer. What's wrong with Hitler? Asked the unsuspecting African, quote unquote. He wants to rule the whole world, snorted the British officer. What's wrong with that? He's German, you see, said the British officer. 
trying to appeal subtly to the African's tribal consciousness. What's wrong with being German? You see, began the British officer, trying to explain in terms that would be conceivable to the African mind. It is not good for one tribe to rule another. Each tribe must rule himself. That's only fair. A German must rule Germans. An Italian, Italians. And a Frenchman, French people. But the extremely wary British officer did not say a Britain, Britons. What he said, however, carried weight with the Africans who rallied the thousands under the, under the British flag. So the, the, that's that hypocrisy we are talking about, that soon, you know, it became very apparent, like, well, that's the logic we're using. Shouldn't a, a Zimbabwean rule Zimbabweans? Shouldn't a Nigerian rule Nigerians? And that spurred even further these ideas of African nationalism. I finally, a very important reason that spurred nationalism was this, was the hundreds of thousands of fighters we have spoken about returning home victorious, right, from having stopped uh, Hitler and the, and, and the spread of Nazism and, uh, and the likes in Europe, only to come back to being second-class citizens, only to come back and not being able to vote or not being able to own property or only to come back to see that their fellows had been moved to the, to the reservations, if you will. Um, you can own land and these things. So that idea of, or oh, oh, even worse, being brutalized once we start talking about South Africa and the birth, birth of, of apartheid a couple of years after the war, um, you know, being brutalized, not being allowed into, into cities uh, without a pass, these sort of things this would go on to, to anger and frustrate the, the uh, our different African groups even more, spurring them further into nationalism. And this reason is not unlike how, how African-American fighters returned to the USA and were, in, were again, came back to victorious only to come back to be subject to Jim Crow laws at the time, which, would, which in itself would go on to inspire uh, the, the, the uprisings of the 60s um, in, in, and what became the civil rights movement and some of the radicalism that came there from. Um, so there is this pa um, parallel between the growth of anti-colonial movements in the mid 20th century and the growth of the civil rights movement in the US in the, in the mid 20th century as well. So as a result of all these things, uh, independence movements would kick in in 1951 going forward with the first one being Libya. Uh, in 1957, Ghana becomes the first sub-Saharan African country to get independence. Then in 1960, we see France pull out of the colonies in, in large part. So that is known as the year of Africa because that is the year that uh, the bulk of countries got their independence and so forth. And we'll talk a little more about that in coming weeks. So that's about the Second World War and Africa's involvement with it. So some of the things that I would have you think about as takeaways is what nation occupied Libya and Ethiopia as part of their late entry into the scramble for Africa? And in what year did they invade, it, if, uh, it, did they invade Ethiopia? From what body did Eli Selassie ask for help? Remember, he didn't get it, but he asked for it. And what year did he re return to power? And that's just important because we talk about Ethiopia never having been colonized, um, but it was invaded for this tiny period. Name the German troops sent to assert Nazi presence in, in Africa as Hitler tried to reclaim German's place in the tropical sun. Then think about three outcomes of the Second World War in Africa. We spoke about maybe half a dozen plus more. What were some of the outcomes of the Second World War on Africa? And also just as an interesting as, a, as, a, as an interesting tidbit, what was the name of the letter written by the ANC, the African National Congress in South Africa, as a response to the Atlantic Charter? And that is one of the uh, resources that I'll put in the description comments below the video. So thank you for joining us today. 
I'm glad you, you came. Please tell somebody to tell somebody to tell somebody like and subscribe and join me next week when I do a video on the, when we establish a balance sheet of colonialism so we can have that conversation, frankly. Um, thank you so much for, for joining me and happy learning and have a good weekend and week.